My name is Ross Arnold, as Travis said. Um, I am the a lot of different background. Uh, my primary field in terms of academic pursuit has been philosophical and systematic theology. I am an ordained Presbyterian minister and pastor of a church in Mexico, but I also am the director and senior professor of Lakeside Institute of Theology uh, in Mexico. But down through the years as I've been teaching, I've had a special passion for cultural anthropology and for the history of religions and culture, and so that's what we're going to talk about quite a bit today. Um, excuse me for, for sitting, but like you, I'm having a little trouble, and again, it doesn't help me or you if I'm weaving back and forth and you all are getting sick. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be seated here. Um, there's several things that we're going to talk about as we go along. We're going to be looking at the religious, cultural, historical background to a lot of the places where we're visiting. But um, I, I will tell you that my wife and I um, live in Mexico. As I mentioned, we have several people on board the boat who are from Mexico or from our community. So you'll have the opportunity to sort of meet people and ask them who's from Mexico. But um, as we talk about being from a place and why we're from that place, I would ask you a question. This cruise, why are you here? Why are you on this cruise? Now, apart from the fact you're on a beautiful sailing ship in the Mediterranean Sea, um, why this one? Why did you come on a cruise that's called Footsteps of Faith? Um, whether or not you chose this cruise because of the, the sailing ship or because of the Mediterranean, whether you realized it or not, when you came here, the parts of the world where we're going to be visiting, the particular locations in the Eastern Mediterranean, are quite literally where human civilization began. This is the part of the world where writing was invented, where the wheel was invented, where the first cultivated crops started, where animals were first domesticated. This was where human civilization, in any sense that we understand it, began. With, with uh, a little bit of a nod toward the Indus River civilization in Pakistan and India, which only has been discovered in the last century that may be as old as the Mesopotamian culture. But as far as we know, this is where all of human civilization, and most especially everything that we know of as Western civilization, started from. Um, the Eastern Mediterranean region is where we uh, developed philosophy, democracy, medicine, literature, science, technology, architecture, history as we know it, theater, sports, you name it, and it started here where we're going to be visiting over the next two weeks. The foundations for everything that we think of and know as Western civilization is in the locations where we're going to be visiting, all right? So um, this particular map, which I'm sure you've seen from the brochures, I took some medicine this morning, it's making my mouth dry, so I'm going to have to have some water clothes. Um, these locations are, um, as I say, the source of Western civilization, not just in terms of science and architecture and all that, but also in terms of religion, in terms of the religion of the Western world, that is. Here, in this area of the Eastern Mediterranean, both the primitive polytheisms of the, the Mesopotamian region, and I'll explain what that means in a second, to the more sophisticated polytheism or belief in multiple gods that the Greeks and the Romans had, and the Egyptians as well, and most especially, this was where the three great monotheistic religions, the, the religions that believe in one god, Judaism, uh, Christianity and Islam, they all started right here. Those are the religions today of more than half of the world's population. Um, even if you happen to be a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Confucian uh, follower of Confucianism or a Taoist, even if you are of one of the uh, Asian religious beliefs, if you grew up in the United States, in Canada, or in Western Europe, you have grown up in a culture and an ethos that is based upon those three great monotheistic religions. So over the course of this voyage, we're going to be talking about not, not only the beautiful and interesting places that we're going to visit and see, but also the very roots and the source of civilization as we understand it in the West. Okay, um, I am over the next, uh, this is the description that you would have seen in the brochure, and I highlighted the part that says that we are going to 
follow the footsteps of religion through the, throughout the ages, walk the paths of history, and retrace the beginnings of Western civilization. So that's why I'm here, is to help you get that kind of background to fill in the gaps for the places that you're going to be visiting and seeing. Now, um, this is not a college course. You're not going to be tested. I'm not going to give you a lot of dates that you've got to remember. I have to give you some dates or it wouldn't make any sense. But we are going to have sort of a broad scope. And I'm even going to try to give you maybe some hooks that you can remember some critical things about ancient history that may be a little easier than courses that you took when you were in college. The, the particular lectures that I'm going to do during this trip, uh, the first one today, of course, is the introduction to the footsteps of faith. I, the next talk is going to be on the Crusades. One of the most misunderstood uh, periods in history are the Crusades. And we're going to be visiting, starting with Rhodes, uh, which we'll visit in two days, um, visiting a number of different locations which were centers of the uh, Crusaders. Then we're going to talk about faith and culture in the A-N-E, which the A-N-E stands for the Ancient Near East. We think of this area, particularly Israel and the areas around it, as being the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason why we call it the Middle East, historians call it the Ancient Near East because it used to be the point of reference that everybody thought, thought of was Greece. That was where civilization was. And from Greece, these areas were the Near East. Well, then the focal point or the point of reference shifted to Western Europe. Rome, particularly in other parts of Europe, and all of a sudden it wasn't the Near East anymore, it was the Middle East. So the Middle East, the ancient Near East are the same places. Um, and we're going to talk about that. Now, then we'll talk about the birth, birthplace of empires. You've heard of the, the Roman Empire, you've probably heard of the Babylonian Empire, but there are others, the Hittites, the Parthians, a lot of others that were very significant. We're going to give you kind of an overview of all of that. Then uh, we're going to talk about the children of Abraham. Again, the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all three trace their roots back to one person, and that is Abraham. And so we're going to talk about those three great monotheistic religions, how they trace their roots to Abraham, and how they differ. How they're the same, how they differ. We're going to look at Alexander the Great, very cool guy. Alexander the Great who conquered the whole known world, and in doing so, he not only conquered everything, but he changed everything. He made everything relate to the Greek culture. We'll talk about that. <coughs> then, because we're visiting Crete, we'll discuss the mysteries of the Minoans, one of the most ancient of civilizations that, again, has only been discovered in the last century or so. And then finally, as we head back to Monomvasia and then back to Athens, we'll talk about the unlikely rise of Greece, how Greek, the uh, the. Greeks and Greek culture influenced everything as we went along, okay? Those will be the, the talks that we have over a period of time, but let's jump into it with this foundational lecture. Now, the to give you a context, this map, and by the way, I have a pointer, and the pointer works great except when it's on that TV screen, so it's not very useful to me. This gives you a perspective in terms of where we are. This obviously is Europe, and on the left-hand side there, you can see Spain and Portugal, France, Germany, etc. The area that we particularly are concerned about here is this part, which is the Eastern Mediterranean. Again, what was called the Ancient Near East, most of which we think of today as the Middle East. That's where we are, and that's what we're going to be talking about. This map gives you, and you'll notice that this is called the Ancient Near East. Um, the countries, Greece is not often considered the Middle East, but it really was part of the cultures of the ancient Near East. Greece, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and a little bit more of North Africa, what we know as, as Libya. That's the area that is considered the ancient Near East. Most of that we call the Middle East today. Now, we we think of this as a four corner of the world. This is like an exotic area, but it hasn't always been thought of that way. This map, which was uh, its a very old map, there's something a little different about this than what you're used to seeing. What is that? Do you notice anything unusual about this? What's in the middle? Africa. Well, Africa, but especially, you can't see my pointer, especially <laughs> the, the Middle East is right in the middle. This is very much the perspective that most of the world has had until very recently. 
we Americans, Canadians, Western Europeans, we are very ethnocentric. We think we're the center of the whole universe and always have been. That's not the way most of the world has looked at the world through most of its history. They have seen this area, the Eastern Mediterranean, as the center of the universe. In fact, if you, how many of you have been to Delphi? I know a couple of people told me they were. Did you see the Omphalos? Do you remember? Did anybody tell you about the Omphalos? The Omphalos is a stone, and it looks sort of like a bullet or half a football. The Omphalos is considered the belly button of the world, and it's at Delphi, literally the navel of the world. But Delphi is not the only place that makes that claim. Thebes in uh, Egypt also claims to be the belly button of the world. And if in, if in Jerusalem, if you visit the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre, they will show you a place on the floor that is supposed to be the navel of the world, the belly button of the world. The thing that those th have in common, Greece, Israel, Egypt, is they are all part of this ancient Near East. This part of the world has always been seen as the center of the world, as the crossroads. In fact, this is a map, um, a, a quite ancient German map, which very much gives you that perspective. You will notice in the upper left, the northwestern part of that lobe is Europe. The northeastern part is Asia. The southern part is Africa. Right in the middle, this particular map says Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of the world. In fact, if you look at the Eastern Mediterranean, the whole area, Israel, what we call, what has historically been known as the Levant, is a bridge, a land bridge, between the great ancient areas of <coughs> Europe, of Asia, and Africa. You want to go from one of those places to the other, where do you have to go through? Yes. This Israel and the area, the Levant as it was called, this area of the ancient Near East. So this really is, in a very real, real way, geographically, as well as historically and culturally, the very center of the world. The very first human civilization we know about, again with a nod to the Indus River civilization in Pakistan and India, which is fairly newly discovered, um, is in the area that is known as the Fertile Crescent, or Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia literally means, you've heard the, the word Mesopotamia, that word literally means the land between the rivers. Yeah. And the rivers are the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, which I can't point at. The, <laughs> if you, you see the word Akkad there. The river that's just above that is the Tigris River. The one running just below it is the Euphrates River. And these rivers run into the Persian Gulf, which you see in the lower right-hand corner there. This area that area that is watered by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and their tributaries, and you'll notice that it curves. It is a crescent. It curves around into what we know as Israel, because Israel also is watered by the Jordan River, you know, the waters between Galilee and the Dead Sea, and frequently the Fertile Crescent is drawn and curves all the way down into Egypt because of the Nile River. This area, which was naturally watered by those rivers, is the place the Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, the place where in the Neolithic period, Neolithic period is the late Stone Age, roughly speaking between 10,000 BC and 5,000 BC. It is where people first settled down. People first stopped being nomadic hunter-gatherers. They began to domesticate animals and crops. They invented irrigation. They invented the wheel and the plow, and they built the first series of cities. Now, I want to be careful here because if you, if you go online and you, you put in um, a search for the world's oldest city, you'll get at least a half a dozen different answers. And everybody's absolutely sure they know which one it is. Um, some people say Jericho in Israel. Some say Damascus or Aleppo in uh, Syria. Some Uruk, which is on this map um, in the Mesopotamian area. Some say Kadal Hayek in Turkey. Some say uh, Varanasi. We were talking last night about Varanasi. Some say Varanasi is the oldest city in the world. There's a new contender, uh, Gobekli Tepe in um, Turkey, which they say maybe 11,000 BC, which is huge to, to have uh, structures. But the idea is in this area of the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia is the first place we had multiple cities being built. And cities mean civilization. You may not think so if you've lived in a large city. <laughs> but cities are, what a city was is where people stopped moving, 
they learned to grow crops, which mean they had enough to eat. They could stay in one place. And because you need multiple people to take care of crops and animals, they would start gathering. And so they'd start building multiple dwellings. And before you know it, you have a city. We're going to talk about that a little bit more under faith and cultures when we get later on. And in fact, I'm just going to be sort of, I'm, we're like a stone skipping over the water today as an introduction, but we'll get into more depth later on. But this area is where civilization, the Mesopotamian area, the Fertile Crescent, where civilization started. They developed, for instance, the first sophisticated numbering systems here. Um, and I'll give you a question. Do you know why there are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 360 degrees in a circle? Because the ancient Mesopotamian, particularly the Sumerian cultures, developed decimal systems, our base 10, but they also had a hexadecimal system that was based on sixes, a, a base six, for those of you who are mathematically oriented. And so because that ancient culture had a base six system for numbering, we have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 360 degrees in a circle. So you are rooted in that culture all the way back then. So this was the first and perhaps most important of the cultures. I, I'll also point out, we'll get into this when we talk about empires, that the importance of rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates River were the foundation of the Fertile Crescent. The Nile River in Egypt, another one of the most ancient of cultures. The Indus River civilization, in, which we're not going to get into in this lecture, we'll talk about it. If you want to talk to me about it, we'll grab a corner somewhere. But the Indus River civilization in Pakistan and India was based on the Indus River and the Ganges River. A little bit later on, the Chinese cultures developed around the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers. The only ancient cultures in the world that weren't based on rivers were the Meso what Mesoamerican cultures, the Olmecs and some of the American ancient civilizations. And they are actually, they didn't have to have rivers because they primarily grew up in rainforests. They had plenty of water coming from elsewhere. But the rivers, the rivers mean life. Water means life. It means, you know, for people to live, for crops to grow, etc. And so the rivers were the central point of ancient civilizations. So in addition to me the Mesopotamian culture, we also have one of the most ancient cultures, very similar, slightly behind it in time, is the Egyptian culture based upon the Nile. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about empires and about faith and cultures. But the Nile River is um, only at the widest about 15 miles wide. In, in Egypt, only 3% of the whole land of Egypt is inhabitable. And that's exactly the strip along the Nile River. Everything else is terrible desert. You can't live there. But the Nile River has made it possible, very fertile, uh, every year for about four or five months, the Nile River floods. And when it very calmly, it, it sometimes have had you know bad floods, but generally the water just rises and it stays up for months, and then it goes back down very predictably. And when it goes back down, it leaves behind all this fertile soil. In fact, the Egyptians, the ancient name they had for their own land was the Black Land because of the fertility of the soil that was left behind by the Nile. Well, because of that, the water of the Nile and the fertility of the area around the Nile, that too is an ancient culture where they could grow food, where they could settle. We'll talk about how that all developed. But these two, the Mesopotamian cultures, the Tigris and Euphrates River system, and the Nile River really are the basis for modern human civilization. Now on this, the next two days, we're going to be visiting two locations. Today we stop in Patmos, and tomorrow we're going to be in Ephesus. Those two locations have both have very ancient histories, but in particular the part of those places that we're going to be focused on, and the, the part that really brings us there, is the first century in those, those locations. Um, the first century in Patmos, the first century in Ephesus are the times in which a lot of events happen that you may have heard of, people that you may have heard of, and so we're going to talk about those two locations. And when we talk about the first century in Patmos and Ephesus, we're really talking about a time when multiple of these ancient cultures came together. Um, we want to look at a couple of those right now in, by way of introduction to Patmos, Ephesus, and to a lot of what we're going to see. The four, four real cultures we want to talk about are the Greek culture, 
the Roman culture, which came later, and then two religious systems, the Jewish religious system, uh, the first great monotheism, and then Christianity, because those four things together, Judaism and Christianity as religions, the Greek culture and the Roman culture, um, those four things merged in the first century in the ancient Near East, and there's no better locations to be able to see that merging of cultures than Patmos and especially even Ephesus. So I want to talk about those four great cultural influences, two religions, two uh, general cultures, kind of in order. The first one of those I want to talk about is uh, Judaism. Now, I want to give you, if you, you know, if you're Jewish, I'm sorry, uh, for what I'm, you know, <laughs> because I'm about to simplify the wonders of uh, Judaism in, in, to, for the lay uh, people who don't know that much about Judaism. And I'm going to tell you, if you want to understand, historically understand Judaism, you need to know three people. The three primary characters that existed in Jewish history that made Judaism what it is. And the first one of those is Abraham, Father Abraham. We're going to talk about him more when we come back to the lecture on children of Abraham. But somewhere around 2000 BC, I've got circa. By the way, anytime you ever see a date and it's got a C in front of it, that means circa, which is a, a shorthand way of saying, this is the best we know. This is the best we can do. It's about circa 20, 2091 or about 2000. Abraham was called by God to get up and follow him. God said, go where I take you. Uh, you become my guy, I will become your God, and I will make of you a great people. And so Abraham became the father of the Hebrew people, or the Israelites, as they were called later. And so Abraham is responsible for them being a people, the people of God. So Abraham's the first one. He was the father. The second one you need to know is Moses. Moses comes along around 1500 to 1450. In fact, if you want to remember this, 2,000 Abraham, 1,500 Moses, 1,000, the third person I'm going to talk about in a second is David. So about 500 years separating them is an easy way to sort of, you know, hang your hat and understand. Moses comes along, the Israelites, through a series of things, are in captivity as slaves in Egypt. Moses is called by God to go back to Egypt after having left there years before and bring the people out of captivity. So Moses both brought the people out of captivity uh, in Egypt, and then through Moses, God gave the law. And so the religion of Judaism started with Moses. It didn't start with Abraham. The people of Israel started with Abraham, but the religion of Judaism started with Moses and the giving of the law. So Abraham was the father, Moses was the lawgiver, and the third important person you need to know about Judaism is David, King David. David was not the first king of Israel, that was Saul, but David was the one, you know, a friend of God, who really made them into a great nation. And so the nationhood of Israel is really based upon King David. King David is the one that they've always looked to as being the symbol of what Israel is as a nation. So the, to, the Jewish people have always looked to Father Abraham, Moses the lawgiver, and King David as being the core to their their not only sense of nationality as a people, but also to their religious faith. Uh, when David became king, he created, out of the Jewish people, a, a, a great nation. Under David and his son Solomon, Israel became of some substance. This map shows the Hittite. Again, the, the Hittites are mentioned in the Bible. You may not know much about the Hittite Empire, but this shows the Hittite Empire, but right alongside it, down the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, this was the kingdom of Israel under David. It actually grew more under Solomon, right around the, the year 1000 BC. So Moses 2000, uh, the, I'm sorry, uh, the Abraham 2000, Moses 1500, David 1000. And then a thousand years later, of course, Jesus comes along. But a great nation was created under King David and King Solomon. Now. The Jews gave us, very simply, monotheism. We know that. The first great monotheistic religion. But in addition, the Jews gave us a sense of absolute morality, right and wrong. There had been no religion prior to that that was based upon an ethical principle. That how you acted mattered. 
Prior to that, it pretty much had been, you know, if, if you can get away with it, it's okay. It must be fine. The Jews had a sense of right and wrong, of morality, of personal responsibility, that I have a responsibility to do things the, the right way, a sense of a desire to do better, that you can improve yourself, all based upon what God calls you to, and also a clear picture of the forces that affect us. The, the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible, tells us how the world was created, how human beings got broken, how sin came into the world, and where we go from there. So there's a sense in which they gave us not just monotheism, but the whole ethical structure that became the basis of Western civilization. Okay, Now, a couple of other facts about the Jewish people. Um, after David, his son Solomon took over, and Solomon had trouble with women. <laughs> Solomon married many foreign wives, and in doing so, he began, he not only allowed them to worship foreign gods, but he himself got involved in that. He built, he built um, places for them to worship. And when we talk about worshiping foreign gods, that involved things like child sacrifice. So Solomon offended God in that way. And so after Solomon's death, the kingdom gets divided between Solomon's heirs, that is the heirs of David and his son Solomon, and others. So the kingdom gets divided in two. There is the northern kingdom of Israel. Very confusing. I don't know why they didn't come up with a better name. Because the whole of Israel got broken up into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, in 722 BC, the empire of Assyria destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel completely. There were ten of the twelve tribes of Israel in the north. Those are the ten lost tribes of Israel. You've heard of the lost tribes of Israel? Assyria, Assyria were a rough bunch of guys. When they destroyed a country, they destroyed it thoroughly. So much so that the ten tribes that lived in the northern kingdom of Israel were lost. They're gone. Okay. Then there's the, still the southern kingdom, which was called Judah, which is where we get the word Jew, by the way, from Judah. And the southern kingdom was destroyed by Babylon, or Babylonia, um, in eight, uh, 586. That led to the Babylonian captivity and the Jewish diaspora. To understand Judaism, you have to understand diaspora, which means the spreading out, where they were taken into captivity and they spread out everywhere. There were Jews everywhere around the Mediterranean because of this, and then also because later on there's a second diaspora. But then in 538, the Persian king Cyrus conquered Babylon. This is a series of just one empire conquering the next. Assyria was conquered by Babylon, was conquered by Persia. And when Persia and King Cyrus, he had a very different idea as to how to treat conquered people, he told all the Jews, you can go home if you want. You can go back to Jerusalem. And so you have the return of the Jews to Jerusalem and to Israel, the rebuilding of the temple, and the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. That's what the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament are all about. So you've got the Jews have returned, but then, about 200 years later, in 332, Alexander the Great, who we're going to talk quite a bit about on this trip, conquers the Persian Empire. So the Assyrians are conquered by the Babylonians, are conquered by the Persians, are conquered by Alexander the Great, the Macedonian or Greek uh, civilization. When he conquers the Persian Empire, everywhere that he went, and by the way, um, well, I'll back up to that. Everywhere Alexander went, he introduced Greek culture and the Greek language. Did it ever occur to you to wonder why the New Testament of the Bible was originally written in Greek? Because by that time, everybody spoke Greek because Alexander had conquered everybody and told them, you now speak Greek. <laughs> Plus, Greek culture was very attractive. They really liked it. And, if, and one of the things you can understand, too, if you've read the New Testament at all, you read about the Pharisees and you read about the Sadducees. They were two of the main four, two of the four main parties in Israel in that time. The Pharisees were Hebraic Jews, which meant they didn't like the Greek culture. They didn't like speaking Greek. They wanted to speak Hebrew. They wanted to keep the old ways. The Sadducees, who ran the temple and were really the, the political authorities, they were Hellenized. They spoke Greek. They liked the Greek culture. They wanted to be more Greek. One of the big reasons that these two fought against each other, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, with Jesus sort of standing in the middle during that time, was because they differed on whether they were willing to accept Greek culture. That's the extent to which the Greek culture after Alexander affected everything, even the Jews. The great monotheistic committed to the one God, 
even they were torn by the commitment to Greek culture, all right? Now, the Greek culture had begun back in sort of, uh, well, it actually had begun about 1400 BC, uh, 1400 years before Christ. The earliest part of the Greek civilization was the, was the Mycenaean culture that we'll talk about. Um, then we have, during the 5th century BC, the 400s, we have the Golden Age of Greece, and this is what it, the map looked like then. Greece in its Golden Age didn't, didn't control a lot of territory. I will have you notice, over here on the right, which I can't point to, um, <laughs> oh, there, there is a section of, you see that yellow section on the right-hand side? That's actually part of what we know as Turkey. It was part of the Persian Empire. That's where we're going to visit tomorrow when we visit Ephesus and the great war between Greece and Persia that we're going to discuss happened mostly because of that little yellow strip which was technically in Persian territory but that the Greeks claimed uh, right to. And Ephesus was the place where the Greek and Persian war started uh, because it's, it's, it's in Persian territory but claimed by the Greeks. So this was the time, the golden age in the 5th century BC when the Acropolis, the, the uh, beautiful Parthenon and the other temples on the Acropolis were built. This is the age of Pericles. This is when Sparta and Athens were going at each other. This is where, when we think of the beauty of Greece, the, the architecture and the sculpture and all of that, much of it comes from this period in the fifth century, all right? That's when so much of what we think of as the Greek culture was invented. But in terms of the influence that's global, you notice this isn't very much land. There's not that much that's affected by the Greeks at that point. But a hundred years later, something happens, and that something is called Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great technically was not Greek. He was Macedonian. Today, Macedonia, you know, that well, where he came from is part of the Greek country. There's part of it that Macedonia is an independent country now. But he spoke Greek, uh, was really part of that culture, and in the 300s, he started out, we'll give you, I'll give you details about this later, but he started out and decided that the Persians needed to be punished for having offended Greece and having attacked Greece, and they burned Athens at one point. So he takes off, crosses over into Asia Minor, conquers Asia Minor, and, and keeps going. He conquers all of the Persian Empire, all of the Middle East, Egypt. He travels east. He, he captures... What we know of as Afghanistan, he goes all the way to India, and after 10 years of campaigning, he wanted to go all the way to the Great Sea, all the way to the Pacific Ocean, and his soldiers who had been marching for 10 years said, Al, 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 that's enough. <laughs> Let's go home. And they did, and we'll talk about that. But in the process, he conquered this whole region, and to give you a perspective on how much that is, the purple part is the area that Alexander the Great conquered. And remember, he did it on foot and horseback. Um, one of the great conquerors of all time, and when he conquered all of this area, he did several things. One of the things he did was he founded over 50 cities that he named Alexandria. <laughs> he was Alexander the Great after all. The, the one we primarily know of is Alexandria in Egypt. He, he had over 50 cities. It's sort of like George Foreman. You know, George Foreman has named all of his sons George. Well, Alexander the Great, he founded all these cities and named them all Alexandria. Now, sometimes it was Alexandria, you know, etc. And he'd add something else. But And he introduced the Greek culture all over this region that he conquered. The Greek language um, and the the love of theater, the sports, the dress, everything about Greek culture got spread all over the known world at that point by Alexander. And we see that from that point on, again, that's why the New Testament is written in the Greek language. That's why the Greek culture created such a conflict between the Sadducees and the Pharisees in Jesus' time. Um, the importance of Greek, now the, the positive part of that is that anywhere you went in the world, the known world then, um, you could talk to people because everybody spoke Greek. Now they might, if they were Roman, they would also speak Latin, but they, they also spoke Greek. You know, if they were from some other country, they might speak the native language, but they also spoke Greek. The Apostle Paul spoke, um, you know, he was Jewish, he was Hebrew, he was also a Roman citizen, which means he probably spoke Latin, but he primarily spoke Greek, in addition to Aramaic and several other things. He was a very learned man. But this Greek influence throughout the whole world was very significant, and the Greeks, therefore, 
Uh, it, it said that the Hebrews taught us to feel and the Greeks taught us to think. Greek philosophy, Greek uh, language, that sort of thing. Um, as well as inventing history as we know it, inventing science as we know it, democracy, mathematics, you name it. Okay. Now, a little bit more about Judaism. While Alexander conquered all of this area and brought Greek culture in 63 BC, less than 300 years later, the Romans conquer all of this. The great general Pompey conquered the whole Middle East for Rome and introduced the Roman military system. Then in, in 39 BC, the Romans appoint Herod the Great, who you're going to see, particularly if you go to Masada and other places, you're going to see some of the building that Herod was a great builder. He was also a tyrant, but he was a great builder. So in 63 BC and following, the Romans are in control. Pompey conquers the Middle East for them. And that brings us into the late 1st and early 2nd century, which was the, the late 1st, early 2nd century is when the Roman Empire was at its peak. In fact, they said that the Mediterranean Sea became a Roman lake because this is what the Empire of Rome looked like surrounding the entire of the Mediterranean. Now, the thing is, the, the, the Romans accepted the Greek culture because the Romans were very accommodating in many ways. Now, they could be very cruel if you crossed them, but for the most part, they were willing, to, for instance, the Romans had their own gods, but when they were confronted the Greek culture and found out about the Greek gods, they said, those are pretty cool gods. <laughs> so they took them on and said, there are gods too. Now, some of them, for instance, you get one god with a Greek name and a Latin name, a Roman name, and, but they were very willing to accept all that. In addition to the Greek culture, the Romans brought um, law. The Roman law was one of the most important things that they brought, and it continued to affect legal systems down through history. They brought roads, the Roman roads. They brought bridges and aqueducts. One of the things that the Greeks never figured out was the arch, okay, the simple arch. The Romans invented that, which meant they could build aqueducts. They could build bridges that the Greeks couldn't. They also brought military expertise, civil administration, and order. During the first century in, um, in Roman-controlled Mediterranean, they brought what was called the Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome. So if you think about it, first, everybody could speak the same language, Greek, even if they spoke some other language also. The Romans brought transportation because they built roads everywhere so you could get from one place to the other, plus they brought peace. Uh, bandits pretty much didn't exist during the first century and early second century in, in the Roman areas because they wouldn't stand for it. So you could travel freely. There were no borders. It was all one country when the Romans controlled it. Everybody spoke the same language. That's one of the reasons for, for instance, the great expansion of the Christian faith. Now the Romans were, when they conquered a people, they generally let those people run their own affairs. In, in uh, Israel, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, still controlled the country until and unless they got out of hand. If you created a problem or didn't pay your taxes, the Romans were very quick to come in and step on your neck. But other than that, the Romans let you go. Well, unfortunately, the Jews were ne never very good at following orders or having somebody else control them. So in um, 70 AD, the, Roman re the Romans finally rebelled to the extent that the Jews were destroyed by, the, the, the city of Jerusalem at least, was destroyed by the Roman military. They came in, they besieged the city of, of uh, Jerusalem, they destroyed the city, they destroyed the temple, and the Jews again for a second time when it had a diaspora, a spreading out, where they had to leave there. Now, um, the, Jew, the Jews had been accepted in the Roman Empire prior to that time. In fact, the Jews were the only people allowed to not worship the emperor because they just wouldn't do it. And the Romans finally gave up and said, you guys are fine. But in AD 70, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. This actually is a relief from the, um, the Arch of Titus, which is in Rome, which shows Roman soldiers. And Titus was the general who later became emperor um, who was responsible for conquering Jerusalem. And this shows them, you see the, the menorah there? This is a picture of the Roman soldiers carrying off the goods from the Jewish temple and from Jerusalem. So in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. This led to the second great diaspora, or spreading out. 
This shows you from Palestine, the Jews went everywhere. And in fact, the diaspora continued starting in AD 70 all the way up into AD 500. At various times in history, the Jews have been thrown out of Spain, thrown out of, of uh, England, various other countries. But the fact is that in the first century, this is the, the sort of purple and blue areas here, the Jewish people had spread everywhere. They were located everywhere. Then, of course, at the, the start of what we know as the first century AD, and by the way, um, I use the traditional or historic um, expressions BC and AD. They, of course, mean BC before Christ, and AD literally means an, Anno Domini. I remember people used to say after death. But it's based upon Jesus as being kind of the, the pivot point. Well, scholars who don't want to have a Christian bias today will use the terms BCE, which means before the common era, era, before common era, and CE, common era. So if you read that, BCE and CE is the same as BC and AD. Don't get confused. So uh, Jesus comes along, probably born around 6 BC. The people who originally created the calendar got it wrong. They missed his birthday by four to six years. Probably 6 BC, he died about 27 AD. Christianity comes along. Now, Christianity is rooted in the fact that the Jews expected for God to send a Messiah. The word Messiah, you know, we, we use the name Jesus Christ. Christ is a Greek word, which means the same as the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah. Both of those words, Christ and Messiah, mean the anointed one. The Jews had expected for God to send a special messenger in the line of David to again make Israel great, to drive off its enemies. And so Jesus came, according to the Christians, in fulfillment of the, that messianic expectation. He appealed first to, the, to many of the Jews, but also he appealed then to many Gentiles. And Apostle Paul is the one who took the, the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, throughout the whole known world, prior to Jesus, there was one monotheistic religion. There was one religion that believed in one God, and that was Judaism. A lot of Gentiles, non-Jews, were attracted to this. They got, by that time, the Greek and Roman pantheons of gods had gotten very old. They weren't very helpful. There was no sense, there was no sense of immortality from them. You couldn't relate to these gods. They're all off partying and drinking someplace, and, you know, there's no relationship there. And so people were looking for something else. And a lot of Gentiles were interested in monotheism. And so they found that in Judaism, but these people who were influenced by the Greek culture. Okay, what is the thing that you think about when you think about Greek sculpture? Naked men, right? The Greeks loved the human body. So when Gentiles went to the Jewish faith and said, I'm really interested in this monotheistic religion, they said, fine, you can join. The first thing you have to do as a man is have part of your anatomy cut off. <laughs> and so all of these Greek-oriented Gentiles said, well, I'll stand back here and listen, but that's all. I, I also happen to like bacon, and I like shellfish, and so I'm not going to... So you had a whole category of people, a lot of them called God-fearing Gentiles. The first converts to... to Christianity, who were not Jews, were God-fearing Gentiles. They believed in one God. They weren't prepared to become Jews because of what that meant sacrificing, literally. Um, and so you had a large number of people who were ready to become monotheists, and Jesus, Christianity, gave them that opportunity, which is why Christianity, by A.D. 70, okay, this is only about 40 years after the death of Jesus, this is how far Christianity had spread. And it was not a legal religion. In fact, it was illegal. Um, in, the, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, Nero launched the first persecution in Rome against Christianity. And yet it grew and it grew, particularly because the followers of Christianity, the 12 apostles especially, a disciple was someone who followed, an apostle was someone who was sent. That's the difference. Every apostle was a disciple, but not every disciple was an apostle. There were Twelve apostles plus Paul came along later. They took this message out and shared it with everybody so that by A.D. 70, this is how big Christianity was. By the end of the first century, you see the green parts of this map? That's how much Christianity had grown by the year 100. The uh, golden area is how much it had grown by the year 200. Now remember, this is without airplanes or trains or automobiles or telephones or email or, you know, anything else, really. People shared this great, what they thought was the good news, and Christianity grew amazingly fast. In fact, 
By the year 565, which is immediately prior to the, the, the start of Islam, the, uh, the golden areas here and some of the green areas, that's how much Christianity had grown. The, hard, the bold line is where the Roman Empire was. So Christianity grew beyond the Roman Empire. In fact, in the area that's, that's uh, France, which is the kingdom of the Franks, and the area of Spain, which is the kingdom of the Visigoths on this map, they were pagan barbarians who converted to Christianity. And so Christianity was there because these, these barbarians converted to it. So here you have the first century, and you have the Romans are con in control, but the Greek culture is dominant. You have the Jewish faith spread all over the Mediterranean uh, basin, and many of them are converting to this new faith in Christianity. So you have all four of these elements that are intermingling. And there are no better representatives of this intermingling of the, the Roman uh, domination, the Jewish um, religion, the Christian belief layer on top of that, and the Greek culture, than John and Paul. And when I say John and Paul, I don't mean these guys, all right? It's not this John and Paul. You know, I, people say, well, what about George and Ringo, okay? Um, th so it's not this John and Paul. We're talking about John the Apostle and Paul the Apostle. We are pulling in right now to Patmos. Patmos is, as Travis told you last night, one of the islands of the Dodecanese. Um, it's a very small island. It's 13.15 square miles. Um, it's fewer than 3,000 people live there. It's been populated since ancient times. At one time, they had three temples there, temples to Apollo, to Bacchus, and to Diana. Uh, Diana or Artemis. Diana was the Roman name. Artemis is the Greek name. Remember, they borrowed those gods and used the same name. Um, but it's a very small island, and after a period of time, in like the first century uh, B.C., it was pretty much abandoned. They just decided there's not much here, you know, we've pretty much had all the olives we can eat, so we're going to go somewhere else. <laughs> and so it was abandoned, and the Romans used it as a site for exiling people to. And that's why we're here, is because one of the people that got exiled there was John the Apostle. Now let me talk about John a little bit. Um, John was one of the twelve, in fact he was the youngest of the twelve apostles. He and his brother James, James the Greater he's called, uh, James and John were two of the earliest apostles. James, John, and Peter were the three that were closest to Jesus. They're the ones who went with Jesus on special events. Uh, the Transfiguration and the, the, a number of other special times. The Garden of Gethsemane, for instance. Um, he was traditionally considered, and I believe, the author of five of the books of the New Testament, the Gospel of John, the three letters of John, and the book of Revelation. We are here at Patmos because under the emperor Domitian, Domitian was one of the Roman emperors who was kind of crazy. He actually was the younger brother of Titus, the guy who conquered Jerusalem. Um, and when he became emperor, Domitian insisted everyone call him uh, Dominus et Deus. Dominus et Deus means Lord and God. You had to refer to this guy, to his face, as Lord and God. Well, you got the apostles, the Christians out there, like John, who are saying, no, you're not. Uh-uh, you are not Lord and God. There's a different Lord and God, and he is the divine Jesus, you know, the Son of God. And so Domitian was offended by this. The tradition is that he had John arrested, taken to Rome, and went into the Colosseum, and they uh, threw him in a pot of boiling oil. But apparently John wouldn't cook. He didn't die. That's the tradition. So he came out. They say that the whole, everybody in the Colosseum that, that witnessed this, converted to Christianity because of the miracle of John not dying. That's the tradition. And so when they couldn't kill him, they exiled him to Patmos. He came here. He was here somewhere around 18 months probably. We don't know exactly. Domitian died. Actually, he was assassinated. The Senate had enough of him. They hired a guy to kill him, which he did. Domitian dies. They release, his, his successor releases all the people that were imprisoned under Domitian. John is released to go back to where he had lived before, which is Ephesus. John had lived in Ephesus. Tradition has it he had spent about 12 years after Jesus in um, Israel. And then when a lot of the, the apostles went elsewhere, John came to Ephesus, planted a church here, a church that later the apostle Paul came along and helped. But he had been in Ephesus. He came to Patmos. On Patmos, while he was exiled there, John wrote the book of Revelation. When you go here, and by the way, this picture, 
The reason why there's an eagle, the bird there, is each of the evangelists, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, has a symbol. Matthew is always symbolized as a man. Mark is always symbolized as a lion. Luke is an ox. And John is an eagle. So whenever you go into a, a, a cathedral, a Catholic church, or anything anywhere, monastery, and you see the symbols of oxen and you know an ox, an eagle, um, a lion, and a man, that's the four evangelists, the four gospel writers. Well, John wrote the Revelation. He had a vision from God and wrote the Revelation or the Apocalypse of John. Apocalypse means revelation, a revealing of something. It doesn't mean everything blows up and the world ends. That's not what apocalypse means. Apocalypse literally means a revelation. So here on Patmos, and Travis introduced you to that, this is a quote from the book of Revelation, from the first chapter, the ninth verse, um, that I was in a holy cave, uh, the holy cave of the apostle, apocalypse. I was on the island of Patmos. John had a vision. So when you're on Patmos, you will, this is, they built a building over where the cave is. This is the building. This is a monk. The last time we were here, uh, I got this great picture of one of the Orthodox monks who, is, who lives on Patmos now. Um, he was very kind to let me take his picture. So this is where you will enter into the cave of the apocalypse where John wrote, uh, traditionally, John wrote this, uh, this book. And by the way, an old uh, uh, mentor and pastor of ours uh, who does a lot of trips overseas. He said whenever you go someplace and they go, this is the cave where John wrote, the, or this is the, you know, this is where Jesus was crucified. He said, don't, we can't just deny those traditions because there's, there's very often something to them. He said, but we see something like that and they said, this is where, and you go, well, one wonders. <laughs> one wonders. <laughs> so this traditionally is where John wrote the book of Revelation. He dictated it to his assistant, his secretary, amanuensis is the Greek word for secretary, who was named Prochorus, and that's what this mosaic is about. This very dark picture is what it will look like inside. Most of these pictures I took, this one I did not because you're not allowed to take pictures inside, so this is one off the internet. But inside you will see where John supposedly lived, where he dictated the Revel book of Revelation. They have a little place, a niche, which is sort of gilded, where he supposedly laid his head, a, a, a cut-out place in the rock. The other thing, besides the cave of the Apocalypse, where John wrote the, the book, is the actual monastery. The monastery was built in the 11th century by a man named Ioannis, um, Ioannis Christodoulos. Christodoulos literally means a slave of Christ. He was a monk who was given permission by the Byzantine emperor they gave him the whole island and said, do with it what you will, as a reward for the fact that Christodoulos had told uh, Alexius Comenensis, who was, became the emperor, before he became emperor, you will be emperor. And so he rewarded him by giving him Patmos. They built this monumental, it's a fortress, a monastery, for a good reason. Because in those days, they had a lot of trouble with the Turks. You know, this is in the 11th century, which is when the Crusades started. So there were a lot of problems with conflict with Muslim armies, and they had navies, too and also with pirates. And so um, you will see that this is very much a fortress area. Um, inside this, this mosaic on the left, that is Christodoulos on the right, giving John the Apostle this monastery, okay, mosaic. And you'll see some of the images, uh, very interesting inside. They have a wonderful museum. They've got the treasury inside. This is a picture of the port of Scala, the town, looking down from the monastery. Um, in fact, in 2009, Forbes magazine named um, Patmos Island as the most idyllic place in Europe to live because of the tranquility of the whole place. And you get all sorts of images like that. This is a picture I took of a little chapel from up on top of the mountain. So quite, quite extraordinary. Now, in addition to Patmos, I'm going to finish pretty quick here. Uh, this is an image in the monastery of Jesus with Mary and John. When Jesus was on the cross, Mary and John, John was the only one of the apostles who was at the foot of the cross, because probably because he was the youngest. All right? John lived until he was almost 100, but he was in, um, until about the end of the first century. He was probably only 15 or 16 years old, maybe 16, when Jesus was crucified. He was very young. And so that probably he was able to be at the cross because he didn't look like a threat, like Peter or some of the others might have been. Well, from the cross, Jesus said to Mary and John, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. In other words, he gave Mary and John to take care of each other after his death. Tradition has it that 
John took Mary with him when he went to Ephesus. And so when you get to Ephesus, so John is connected to both Patmos and Ephesus, where we're going to be today and where we're going to be tomorrow. So when you get to Ephesus, you will see the upper right-hand corner is the traditional house of Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. The lower right is where is the traditional burial place of St. John in Ephesus, because he went back to Ephesus and died there. And he was like the elder. John was the elder for all of the... Um, Asia Minor, all of the churches of Asia Minor. And if you read the book of Revelation, it starts out with short letters to the seven primary churches in Asia Minor. Go back and, you know, uh, read the book of Revelation, and Ephesus was the lead of all of those churches. And that is actually the church of the, of the Virgin Mary is the church that we're talking about there. <coughs> so tomorrow we get to Ephesus which is both linked, and there's an arrow there, which I can't point to, uh, which says Ephesus, <laughs> on the coast of Turkey. And we're going to visit there. John was there, and the Apostle Paul was there. Now, Paul, uh, give me five more minutes and we'll finish here, okay? Uh, Travis is standing back there, and if he starts waving his hand violently, I know I have to stop, okay? Um, the Apostle Paul, the, the images we have here, the one in the center top is of Paul falling off of his mule, because... Paul was a Jewish um, zealot, almost. He was a Pharisee, he says, but he was very committed to the faith, and when Christianity came along, Paul opposed Christianity. In fact, he vehemently opposed it. He got letters uh, from the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem to go to Damascus in Syria to capture these Jews who had converted to Christianity and had run away. On the road to Damascus, a bright light flashes. He is knocked from his ride, from his mule, he, um, he hears a voice saying, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? Or Saul, Saul, because he, he was named Saul at that point. He later became Paul. This was when he was converted. Saul says, who are you, Lord? And the voice says, I am Jesus whom you persecute. At that point, Paul converted to a belief in Jesus and became one of the strongest advocates and evangelists for Judaism. The picture on the upper right is Paul and Peter, which you often see pictured together. Um, you can always tell Paul because he's bald. <laughs> Peter usually is carrying keys. The lower right-hand picture is the Library of Celsus, which Travis mentioned last night, one of the most photographed uh, and ancient uh, places in the whole world. That's in Ephesus. I mentioned that Paul, Paul was responsible for much of the, sh of the spreading of the gospel into Asia Minor and into West uh, the Eastern Europe, particularly Greece. These are his travels. He had three missionary journeys. Possibly a fourth one, the guy got around over 10,000 miles of travel that Paul did. And again, he didn't take a train, he didn't take a plane. Okay, most of it was on foot, some of it might have been on a donkey. The, in particular, the third missionary journey is the one in which he visited Ephesus and spent somewhere between two and three years. We don't know because the Hebrews tended to round things off, but he spent between two and three years in Ephesus. There was already a church there that Paul, that uh, John had founded. Later on, John, uh, uh, Paul's disciple Timothy becomes the pastor of the church there in Ephesus. So it's a very significant early location for Christianity. John, Paul, Timothy, all very involved there. The city of Ephesus itself doesn't look like this today. <laughs> it's a little bit more torn up than this. But this is what it would have looked like in the old days. I wish I had my pointer. Sorry. Um, Ephesus was one of the 12 cities of the Ionian Greek cities, but on Asia Minor, which was controlled by Persia. Um, it was a major Roman city. At one point, it probably had over 250,000 people in it. And in case you can't tell, 2,000 years ago, that was a lot of people in one place. Um, it had two agoras, or big marketplaces, public baths, multiple temples. A large outdoor theater. The theater seated 24,000 people, and you're going to see that tomorrow. Um, this was the location in 4, 498 BC, about 500 BC. The Battle of Ephesus was what started the war between uh, Greece and Persia, which more than 100 years later, in retribution for that war, Alexander the Great left Macedonia and crossed over and conquered all of Persia. Today, this is one of the foremost archaeological sites in the world, uh, one of the best preserved classical cities anywhere. If you have not been to Ephesus, tomorrow is going to be an extraordinary, or even if you have, an extraordinary treat for you. Ephesus was actually destroyed four times in its history. Ultimately, it ended up being abandoned because the river silted up the harbor, because it, it was popular because it was a harbor city. It was a, a city of trade. 
But the city, despite their efforts to dredge, it filled up the harbor. So now the harbor is something like, you know, what, five kilometers, I think, away from the city of Ephesus. And so it became impractical as a port city. It got conquered a couple of times by barbarian tribes, you know, various other problems, and eventually was abandoned. Uh, this picture on the left is the Curetes Street. Curetes was the council that ran the city originally. And um, these are not really Romans walking down through there with their t-shirts on. Uh, but, the, you know, it's a huge area. The, it's about a kilometer long, the uh, Curetes. On the right-hand side is a painting and a mosaic. Make sure you go to the terrace houses, which are the houses. Um, in, in fact, if I back up, down here in the lower left-hand corner, you will see uh, the, the sort of red roof thing on the right at the bottom. Uh, that's the terrace houses. They were wealthy people's houses, and they're extraordinary. The mosaics, the paintings, things like that. I already mentioned the Library of Celsus, which was at a, in its day the third largest library in the Roman world. After Alexandria and Pergamum, it had over 12,000 scrolls. A place that you unfortunately will not be able to see is the Temple of Artemis. The Temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, it was completely destroyed uh, between 262 and 401 in various pieces. In its heyday, the Temple of Artemis, as one of the wonders of the world, was larger than a soccer field. Those columns that you see are over 100 feet tall, or about 100 feet tall, over 30 oh. meters. Um, the, the person who first named the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, who, who was Antipater of Sidon, who had seen the, all the ancient wonders, the Colossus of Rhodes, etc., he said this was by far the most spectacular. This was the primary place of worshipping of Artemis of Ephesus. Um, Artemis of Ephesus, which is the picture on the right, you ever see this statue of a, a, and she looks like she's got many, many breasts. Some people say they're eggs, some people say whatever. Um, this is not what Artemis or Diana looked like anywhere else. This was the, the Ephesian version of Artemis, and it was probably a combination of Sibylle, who was the ancient mother goddess of fertility, which was from Asia Minor, and the Greek and Roman goddess, goddess uh, Artemis sort of blended together. So you, she didn't look like this anywhere else, only in uh, Ephesus. And the inter interesting thing was, in 356, a guy named Herostratus burned the Temple of Ephesus. It was rebuilt after that. But he burned the Temple of Ephesus, Ephesus in 356. That was the day that Alexander the Great was born. And they say that the reason why the temple got burned is that Artemis was attending to the birth of Alexander the Great, who was considered divine by many. And so, therefore, she was away from her temple and wasn't taking care of it when it got set on fire. Okay. Um, I'm going to say one more thing, and that is about Rhodes, because we're not going to, I'm not, not going to have a chance to talk to you before that. Rhodes is another one of the Dodecanese Islands. Uh, it's the largest of the Dodecanese Islands. It's compared to the 13 square miles of Patmos. Rhodes is 544 square miles. It's the most popular tourist destination in Europe. Rhodes. In fact, we have a good good friends who are a couple, and they honeymoon on Rhodes. Um, it's only 11 miles from the coast of Turkey, and yet it's owned by Greece. All these islands are, which is one of the one of the things, that, one, kind of the political history mysteries. Um, a very rich history. The thing you need to know about this, which again you will not see, is the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the other wonders of the ancient world. The Colossus of Rhodes was built between 292 and 280 BC. It was a giant statue. Um, it was uh, over. 30 meters tall, again, 100 feet tall. Now, this was built 22, uh, almost 2,300 years ago. Uh, built out of iron and uh, brass and filled with stone. It only stood for about 56 years, and it, in an earthquake, it fell over. Well, even, even lying on its side, on the, on the ground there, it was considered so spectacular that they didn't do anything to it for 800 years. People would come to see it even lying down. It was so spectacular. And so um, this, in fact, the Statue of Liberty is significantly based upon the Colossus of Rhodes, the descriptions of it. It's about the same height. It has about the same, uh, whoops, about the same uh, uh, position. And you've heard, you've all heard the, you know, or maybe you've even seen, 
the inscription on the base of the Statue of Liberty that says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. You've heard that? Mm -hmm. The first part of that quote above that says, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch. So the whole idea behind the Statue of Liberty was the Colossus of Rhodes. It is not there anymore. It's been gone for, you know, 2,100 years. But again, one of the ancient uh, wonders of the world. And you want to make sure when you're on Rhodes that you look for some of the Crusader fortifications. Particularly, the, the one of the military orders we're going to talk about under the Crusade talk is the Knights Hospitaller, the Knights of St. John. They settled here after the Crusades in the 1300s and built uh, some spectacular fortifications. And so you want to make sure you, you, you look out for those. Now, uh, we're past time. I'm 10 minutes over. I apologize for that. Um, are there any questions that you have to ask right now? Or Demetrius. I'm going to stick around. What's that? Demetrius. Um, is, that a, is that just a rumor? <laughs> well. And the gladiator and that. Yeah. What was the question? Here, they said that that was where Demetrius had. Well, I think I think you, Travis, you were uh, were you talking about Demetrius earlier? Well, I, uh, in the stadium. Yeah, we'll get we'll we'll talk about that you know uh, a little bit later when you talk about the faith cultures and, and stuff. Okay. Anything else? I will be around here for a little while. If you have questions, you can come up and ask me. The next talk we do will be Crusades. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.